Why hello everybody, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with me, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 274, 247, 247, or no, 274, 274, 242, I don't know, one of the others anyway, you know what the show is, welcome back, how are you guys doing, how are you guys feeling, great, amazing. Hope you guys are well. How am I? Pretty good, man. I've had a few good days of fasting, a few good days of working out. You know, it's always good to kind of get back into the, you know, on the saddle. I've got that chain going again. The chain being, remember that um, Jerry Seinfeld thing where he says, oh, don't break the chain. I think it was advice to, um, you know, aspiring comics. But I'm guessing you can apply it to every facet of your life. So the idea was that if you want to get better at the thing that you're trying to pursue as a career... You should try and practice a little bit every single day. And the more you practice, the more you build up chain links on the calendar. No, yeah, calendar and you exit off. You kind of exit off the day when you practice or you do the thing you're meant to do. You know, taking pictures, writing, drawing, whatever it is that you do. And then what happens is that over time, you just want to build up a habit of never breaking that link. So you don't want to ever have a, like a gap. So you want to just, even if it's five minutes or 10 minutes Whatever it is, just do something in that day to kind of um, contribute or to go towards um, the thing that you're trying to attain in terms of a career. And um, yeah, it's pretty good when you do that when you're working out and you're all dieting and stuff. It's nice to kind of get back on the wagon and feel like you've got a bit of momentum building up. And then it makes it harder for you to like sip off the wagon when it comes to the weekend. Because that usually is the time when things go a bit haywire for me. I think if there was a championships for Monday and Friday, right, if there was a a Monday to Friday award, like the best Monday to Friday, -er, right? The Monday to Friday warrior, I would win it every year. Every year I'd win it. I'd be the Champions League winner of Monday to Friday. But and unfortunately, life isn't like that, isn't it? Life is 52 weeks, 365 days, seven days a week. So you have to be on it like Sonic every single day. Um, and especially if, you're, especially if you're trying to attain something, if you're not trying to attain anything, you're just happy to just, you know, skate, you know, um, uh, drift by in life and, you know, go to your little Thursday gallery events and have some free drinks at work and go out, you know, and go to some summer parties. And it's all good. But if you want to do something a little bit more meaningful, then it requires a lot more of you, which is fine, isn't it, really? That, that should be, that's a fair exchange. I think I remember Gary V saying the same thing, right? If you want a 1% lifestyle, you have to do 1% things, isn't it? You can't expect to have a 1% lifestyle just coasting by. You have to um, sacrifice in some way, shape, or form. Make yourself feel some way um, uncomfortable, right? I'd imagine so. That's really important. So that's what I'm trying to do now. And again, when what better time to do it than the start of the year when everyone is figuring out what to do and pressing the whole reset button. But anyway, here we are back on the show again. As per usual, this is the number one streetwear podcast in the world. Streetwear for me encompasses all things including art, music, fashion, design, um, streetwear, of course. Um, current events, all that good stuff, literature. I talk about it all in this podcast. And I hope if you're a first time listener, you'll come back again. If you're a first time listener watching through YouTube, then smash that like button, click subscribe so you can come back another time. If it's your first time listening via the podcast app, then why not give me a five star review at the end of the show? Um, share it with your friends. Let them know that I'm talking some, you know, some good stuff. I've got some good information. It's a bit entertaining. Entertaining levels are a bit down, right? Not as high as they could be, but you know, I'm trying my best. I'm trying. I'm getting there, little by little, little by little. So, let's not waste any more time. I've got loads of things to get into, loads of issues I want to talk about, loads of things I want to pile on into. And I hope you guys are strapped in. You've got your beverages. I have mine here, a nice glass of water this evening. And I hope you guys have the same. So, let's get started. Number one thing, right, that I find um, that I wanted to talk about was uh, this book here to catch. Catch and Kill by Ronan Barrow. I've just finished reading this. I bought it last month. It was part of my December reading list. I'm sure some of you are aware that I sometimes read, you know, a few books a month. And this is one of them. I've just about finished it. And, um, yeah, it's a tough read, man. It's a bloody tough read. Ronan Farrow famously is the son of Woody Allen, right? And he was, he's already been at the center of some sort of, you know, sexual misconduct allegations because his sister, Dylan, accused his father Woody Allen of uh, molesting her I think when she was younger no one ever believed her the case got thrown out through lack of evidence or because of, I think the girl at the time or the his sister was really young whatever something happened where eventually Woody Allen got 
um, found not guilty, but then to make the story even weirder, Woody Allen then goes and marries his stepdaughter, right? I think a, a Chinese or an Asian woman who they adopted in their family when she was young, and then that lady grew up, and suddenly Woody Allen married her. And so far, no one seems to care. I think Scarlett Johansson is one of Woody Allen's biggest defenders, said she you know, doesn't care about she, Woody Allen's a friend, she's going to stick by him, blah, 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 blah. So Ronan Farrow's had a bit of a dicey relationship with this sort of stuff anyway. So for him to write this book, Catch and Kill, which essentially kicked off this entire investigation of this book that was published in New Yorker, kicked off the whole um, Me Too movement. It kicked off um, these sexual allegations being put towards these um, uh, men who were in high or positions of power within network television, entertainment industry, all that mess, right? So first off, I'd say there's some misconceptions coming into this as a guy, right? The misconception was that I remember reading or f- finding out through the grapevine that supposedly Harvey Weinstein, who's like the main protagonist of this book, the guy that's, you know, is getting the most um, amount of uh, flack for the actions that he's partaking in, obviously rightly so. But I remember when I first heard the story, the the kind of prevalent thing I remember seeing online was the fact that Harvey Weinstein was this big power broker, right, um, who essentially was... Um, one of the main people who was, he was kind of like the decision maker. He was the one that could kind of ordain your career successful or not successful. So he had this like, you know, outstretched influence on the industry. And the the thing that I heard on the internet was that he would do, he would proposition women, especially attractive women or girls that he was into, doesn't matter what attractive or not. Um, And he would essentially ask them for sexual favors in exchange for Um, career advancement and supposedly you know it's an unwritten rule that sometimes within the entertainment industry two consenting adults can partake in this kind of gray transition right transaction sorry where the woman because you know we all have our i guess as men and women we have these intrinsic qualities that separate us in some way some respects if you would say yeah let's say a man for instance like jordan peterson i think i mentioned it a few times right let's say men have the strength right power or you know, there's always a threat of violence between two guys. So I think if you're arguing with a dude or you're talking nonsense, there's always that line you don't want to cross because it, especially if you don't want to fight the person, it could always kind of escape to that, to that kind of, you know, realm. But if you're a woman, that necessarily isn't really something that's going to be on the table. So women tend to kind of damage each other by damaging each other's reputation, right? Spreading gossip, telling stories, maybe telling some white lies here and there, whatever it may be. So if that's the case, then it's not out of re- it's not out of reason. It doesn't it's not so preposterous to suggest or to imagine a world where some men will use their power and influence to somehow cajole women to give them the sexual favors that they desire. And if the women are game, they will use their sexual prowess in order to lure these powerful men. Right? There will be some sort of weird kind of transaction. And again, it's a bit gray, it's a bit murky, it's a bit yucky. You don't really want to get involved in that sort of stuff, but I can see it happening. So that was a story that you heard, right? Well, how is this guy? If you if you if you give him whatever he wants sexually, then he will follow through his promises, and you will then become the next Renee Zellweger, whatever it may be, right? That was a prevalent the prevalent story that I heard. Then the more you dug into it, the more you heard um, stories or accounts from various women who accused him of sexual misconduct, and then you started hearing the stories of rape. Then it started to get a bit dark. Then you were like, whoa, 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 whoa. This is some mad stuff. And then when you look into it deeper, the thing that really upset me reading this book isn't the fact that Harvey Weinstein is a monster and a really bad guy and somebody who should be, you know, thrown under the prison, right? Don't get me wrong. The thing that really hurts me reading this Catch and Kill book by Ronan Farrell is the amount of people who are complicit to his nastiness. The people in the industry who kind of turned, who kind of turned a blind eye and allow these young, vulnerable women who had no experience, no um, idea on how to navigate the industry, be taken advantage of by an absolute ogre, right? You look at Harvey Weinstein's pictures online, and you think to yourself, yeah, no wonder he did that sort of stuff, right? Because how is he meant to attract women if he's got, if that's that's the kind of personality that he has, right? If he's, like, if he looks like that, how is he meant to attract women apart from, you know, um, essentially proposition them to come upstairs to his room and all of a sudden turning up when you open a door, he's like, you know, in a in a kind of nightgown or whatever maybe. It's just strange. Normal people, right? Even if your friend sleeps around your house, you you feel a bit awkward walking around in your boxes. Imagine telling a woman that you don't even know, right? Someone that's obviously looking at you as some kind of mentor or somebody that can maybe guide them in their career. There is a weird, like, you know, there is something 
quite gratifying about having somebody in the industry, especially if you're, um, it's happened to me a few times where you're a bit of an older guy and a younger person, male or female, is sort of looking at you for guidance. So you, and you feel it, you're like, oh, okay, this person is hanging on my every word. To take that and sort of take advantage of that kind of energy or that kind of dynamic and then suddenly to turn it into like some weird sexual power play is really abhorrent. And again, just goes to show how much of a monster this guy is because again, he got away with it primarily because everyone turned a blind eye and that's the thing that i think is the most telling thing about this book um we know monsters exist right serial killers exist we know that we know those things that's a thing so imagine being in a town or being in a village or in a city where there's a serial killer running rampant but because the serial killer happens to be the ceo of a big powerful brand that employs a lot of people everyone kind of stays quiet that's the kind of level of um cowardice that exists in his book and again Ronan Farrell is a really good guy I think throughout the entire book you get the sense that he was a little bit naive the way he kind of approached the issue with NBC because they didn't want to run his story he keeps talking about how he was really um worried about his losing his job in the whole um in the whole melee of this thing he was really careful about not wanting to embarrass his bosses and knowing open no Oppenheim who I'm shocked how no Oppenheim still has a job that is insane I don't know how that guy is still employed I don't know why NBC decided to still have him as being the kind of main honcho there. But yeah, he doesn't come out of this book um, looking good either. But, you know, Ronan Farrow went with good intentions and then came out of it with a kind of frightening tale of just how difficult it must be for a young woman to kind of exist in Hollywood or in the entertainment industry. And I've wondered that myself anyway for a long time. I thought maybe nowadays, I think because you see the reaction that someone like a Meghan Markle gets or a Kim Kardashian, maybe people don't want, wouldn't care. But I'd love it if we got a documentary or we got some sort of insight or a news report or 60 minutes kind of piece on women, especially women, young women who are really attractive and trying to navigate in the entertainment industry, especially the women who aren't necessarily, um, you know, your A-list actress, actresses or actors, right? For the most part, I'd imagine it would be a really telling um, kind of piece of content for people to see just how grim and just how dark it can get when you're some, when you have when you just happen to be blessed with a certain look, you happen to have like symmetry or you happen to have a, per a particular nose or your body is something that um, men who are into women will be sexually attracted to, whatever it may be. It must be really strange. Like, let alone if you're talented. So, so okay, if you're not talented, maybe it's a little bit of a, you know, it's easy to kind of get an idea of where you sit on a totem pole. But when you're super talented and you're really hot, imagine how weird it must be walking into these rooms with old men in their 60s no real experience dating women outside of the fact that they were able to hook up with a model because they happen to be this guy worth billions, right? Most of the time, you look at Harvey Weinstein, even the, the lady that he was married to who divorced him. Um, there was no way he would have got a lady like that if he wasn't Harvey Weinstein, you know, the big uh, TV or entertainment exec guy, right? That wasn't going to happen. So there's already a lack of experience when it comes to interacting with women of a certain caliber. So imagine you're then in an environment where these guys are sitting in front of them and suddenly these women are looking at them all doughy-eyed and wanting to have a career and stuff. It's just, honestly, it's just a really hard book to read. I, re I recommend it for everyone to read. I think all guys should read this book, Catch and Kill. I think anyone, especially if you're in a scene, especially if you're in any kind of position of power or influence or authority or whatever it may be, right? I think you should really read this book because, again, it makes you, it kind of, even though it's an account from Rowan Farrow, who's a guy, it still tells the story of these women and tells you just how horrifying it must be. There's a there's an account here of this lady, I think that was a TV exec. She wasn't even like... The thing that's really abhorrent in this book too, because that, that was a narrative you heard. Oh, these young actresses, you know, they get into Hollywood, they know what they're getting into. They, if they want to they be the next, you know, Reese Witherspoon, they have to do whatever it takes to get there, right? That's what you hear. Cool, all right? That's BS. Because there's a really random TV exec who's like a nobody, like a showrunner type girl, who ends up getting physically sexually assaulted i think she ends up getting raped in the end of it right by harvey weinstein and the account is really distressing because there's lots of occasions where a more street smart girl would say hey don't go there don't answer the phone but she was so naive she was so happy to have the dream her dream job right working finally in the entertainment industry because anyone that anyone most people would know that those kind of jobs are really highly coveted, right? So And they're oversubscribed, or they're oversubscribed and they're highly coveted. So when you finally do get your foot into the door, you're just happy to be there. If it's getting people's coffees, photocopying, running to the to do the prep run, you don't care. As long as you're in, you're in. So Harvey took advantage of that sort of energy. And this girl in this account, she's one of the kind of last stories towards the end, 
she essentially, you know, she says it even in her account. Like there were so many red flags that she should have been more aware of, but she's not street smart. And in general, why should you have your backup? Why should you be on such alarm when you're working in, when you're in a workplace? It should be a professional environment. It should be, for lack of a better term, a, a pretty safe space, right? You should be able to, um, you know, hang out with your colleagues without thinking that if you stay in the toilet too long, someone might come in and pounce on you. I don't know. That should be, that should be something that should be fairly cool, but it doesn't happen that way. And eventually, I'll be going to take advantage of the situation and essentially destroys her life forever. And that's the thing that's most heartbreaking. He's left a trail of so many broken people. And and from, and even now, he's still denying it. He's obviously, uh, you know, maybe in his interest, he has to deny it because he doesn't want to get served a big sentence. But he's dragging out the case. He's probably not going to see any jail time, really, especially with the status he has and the money and influence and stuff. And it's just really disgusting, really. The only thing I hope of this story is that somehow um, Harvey ends up settling with them, with the women who accused him. And he ends up being completely depleted of all his funds. That would be cool because, again, someone like this, I don't think prison will teach him anything. You know, the same way how Bill Cosby is still denying uh, and still kind of maintaining his innocence, even though he's in prison, right? Charged with flipping, drugging women and sexually assaulting them when they're asleep. I think the same with Harvey. I think if you end up going in prison, it wouldn't change him. He'd still maintain his innocence. And he's still kind of, because I think you said it recently, like he was, he's actually one of the, he said something like he was, he's one of the, the trailblazers in women within the entertainment industry, which is just insane if you read the book. But again, I recommend you read the book, Run and Fire, Catch and Kill. It's really harrowing. It's hard to read. There were plenty of times I was on a train reading this book and I just had to stop and kind of just stare out to the window thinking to myself, bloody hell, man. If you're, if you're a guy and you have a daughter who wants to be an actress or an actor or be a script, a script writer or a showrunner, you're going to, if, if you read this, you're, you're, you're going to want to put anything else in their hand apart from a pen and a keyboard. You're going to be like, nah, forget that. Like go play sports. I don't know. Dig a well, open up a beauty salon, open up a supermarket, whatever it may be. Just get away from the entertainment industry because there's so many douchebags and again the thing that hurts the most is the cowardice the absolute cowardice that everyone that was involved especially women that's the thing that's really disheartening some of the i think they call them honey traps right some of the women that work for Harvard, but again it's just it's so difficult it reminds me of the anna delvey story there's so many this is it's hard because i think if you're a woman you're a conflicted position because again those jobs are so highly coveted right to be Harvey Weinstein's PA or to be within his inner circle at that time prior to the invest prior to the allegations being known in public because I think they'll know the industry you would have been so happy just to have the job you don't want to risk your not having that job anymore by telling on him or by informing the girls that they shouldn't go to his hotel room so essentially they all kind of you know there was these honey traps who were essentially older women or girls that Harvey Weinstein had sexually assaulted in the past who now were in his inner circle or who kind of forgave him for it and kind of moved on, who were being used to kind of lure other naive girls or girls who had their backs up a bit. Girls who were a bit like, mm, this is a bit weird. Why am I going to this old man's room? So that he'd use a girl that he previously might have molested before or a girl that he was in, you know, friends with, quote unquote, and they would lure those new girls um, up to his room. And that room trick, it's just like, everyone's got the same story. You know, he'd, he'd speak to you in person sometimes and ask to see your script or give you compliments and then invite you back to his hotel room and suddenly you walk open the door and he's in his robe. And like I said, mate, how many times have you been with your friends? Your friends slept over or you've been at your friend's house or you've gone on holiday together and you feel embarrassed walking around with underwear with your friends. These are your friends, people you love, people that are essentially your family. Imagine Harvey Weinstein that fat ogre of a guy walking around in his robe naked like in front of girls that he doesn't know or he just met a day ago like the absolute brass neck on him the absolute um again the entitlement to think that somehow he's not going to get in trouble for this it's just like insane and again the he's pleading of his innocence is just like it's just insane i don't understand it but yeah i recommend you check it out man it's a really good book um i finished it, it took a bit longer than a month to finish because again it's hard to read um Ronan Farrow's got, you know, it's just the way he writes is really good, but it's so detailed as well. So there's some harrowing accounts of sexual assault. So if you're feeling a bit queasy, then probably don't. But if you really, especially again, for any young men out there who are trying to get involved in the entertainment industry, especially as a power broker, especially somebody of influence, a decision maker, or a gatekeeper of some sort, you really need to check this book out. I think it's a real good uh, lesson of how to navigate. Uh, the workplace especially when it comes to females and how to kind of just be aware of the things that girls think about that guys don't ever think about right this intrinsic kind of 
fear that maybe if you're alone with a dude you don't know that he's going to get the wrong the wrong impression I don't know man it, it just made me I just felt a lot of sympathy I felt a lot of compassion for the girls women involved and this is again was prior to me reading their accounts on the internet like oh these girls young actresses they get into the entertainment industry they know what they're getting into uh, it's a give and take thing no 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 it's not give and take this guy's a fucking monster and he deserves to be buried under the prison but you know we'll see how it goes with the courts and stuff but yeah check it out The Catch and Kill by Ronan Farrow an amazing expose on uh, lies, spies and conspiracy to protect predators um, yeah, really good book, man. I recommend you check it out. Anyway, let's move on to some happier times. I don't know, I'm kind of dead in the mood a bit, but let's move on to something else a bit better. Um, let's go. So, let's talk about some streetwear stuff because I haven't talked about that in ages. So, we got some Kif New Balances. Kif has got a bit of a bad rep in it. I think I texted my mate about Kif and he gave me some long soliloquy about how naff they are. But I like what Ronnie Fake does, man. I think, again, for somebody that's um, running a contemporary streetwear brand, especially a newer one he has taken it from zero to 100 in a very very short space of time right there it's a very polished operation and i think i remember someone here someone saying about ronnie that he is um he's a bit of a monk like all he does is work and hang out with his family he doesn't do anything else so which explains why it's such a it comes across such a polished brand you get don't get the feeling that it's kind of you know some bedroom operation running on shopify with people shipping stuff a month late it looks like a real polished company like he's trying to build a brand something that he could essentially step away from when he's older or hand the reins to his kids or people that he's close with like that's what it feels like it feels like he's really good a real contemporary kind of streetwear brand again he's really flying the flag for streetwear at that level at that kind of high kind of luxury street lux level i don't know what to call it like if I, if I think of those new white Air Force ones that are going to come out by Kiff, I think of that kind of street lux right um and again one of the main kind of power um, or one of these kind of main tools or one of the main attributes, one of the things that really separates him from the pack is his ability to really smash calibrations out of the park. Like whatever brand it is, he's able to bring the Kif DNA to that brand and offer his customer something really special, something really bespoke, something really, you know, timeless that you can kind of wear, you know, um, regardless of when it came out, they, they still look fresh. And again, for somebody that's a, I, I, I don't know if he's a, if he's a sneakhead by heart, but I'd imagine so. It's very hard to do because once you get the keys in the factory, for a sneaker brand, there is that kind of a law to just go crazy and do all the things that you wanted to do, all the dreams that you had when you were collecting dusty sneakers back in the day. But I think his ability to kind of, you know, again, scratch his own itch as a sneaker head and also kind of deliver to his customers is really unparalleled. And no more, and there's no better example of it than this new uh, balance collaboration that just got featured here on Hypebeast. So it says Ronnie Vague um, reveals the next Kif and New Balance collaboration. Says so the following here, although the world is eagerly awaiting the Air Force One collaboration, which I mentioned previously, is um, one of my favorite shoes um, or something that I'm kind of keeping my eye on. Uh, I'm not sure how a, how ready available they're going to be, but I love them. They remind me of the old school Code.jp or the Japanese only kind of um, Air Force One edition, especially with the little swoosh at the front um, of the toe box. I can't wait for those, but you know i'm assuming they're going to be quite hard to get a hold of but apart from that like again let's just continue the article uh the kid founder ronnie fake is not one of the is not one to rest on his laurels and the queen's native recently teased a new balance take on the seven on the 1700 uh Faye and new balance have put together a prolific amount of releases over the course of the long-standing partnership but this marks the first uh 700 cray by the two and again that's what i like about seven, um, ronnie fake right say we want about the guy or how, about his brand but he takes chances he's always kind of collaborating with brands he could easily kind of just bang out nike collaboration after nike collaboration right just do air force one colorways by the ton but he tends to always go for models that are a little bit under the radar right and then kind of bring them to life and elevate them a little bit and again who's the last person you heard doing a collaboration on a new balance 700 tell me oh wait exactly no one no one's doing that Everyone's doing 574s, 1900, 900, 8, whatever. What's what I've got the 850. Like, no one's doing um, 574, 573, I mentioned previously, right? No one's doing the 1700. It's a real, like, heads new balance, right? You have to be kind of in the know to kind of know about it. And again, for him to kind of sprinkle his DNA on it is a big risk, too, because you don't know if the consumers are going to be willing to buy it. But again, it goes to show just how how confident he is in his uh, ability to actually design and make really good sneakers and again doing collaborations in this kind of way of form especially nowadays is a bit it's a bit it's a bit old school right everyone's now most people are especially there was a period in time where most people especially i think when all the 
been show guys were doing stuff with Nike, it felt as if everyone was trying to make their own model, right? Instead of going doing retros and just changing the colorway, it seemed like the real swaggy thing or the real thing to kind of separate yourself from the pack was to kind of go out there and make your own model, right? Um, design, bring down your, uh, bring your own last, like Jerry Lorenzo did with his Nike collaboration, but really kind of push the envelope and really use the Nike factories or push their factories to the limit. But I also like the idea that some designers, some influencers, some brand owners are also adopting the old school method and just taking a model that already exists and kind of you know changing the colorway somewhat, messing up the materials, which again is probably the hardest thing to do. It's similar, I would imagine, to like fashion. The real, the real kind of high level, the high caliber fashion designers like a Ralph Simmons, you can tell that he, you can, if you put like three suits down a runway, you had them running, walking down a runway, right? Three suits. You could tell um, by the level of finish, just like a simple black suit with a white shirt. You could tell the difference of like a Ralph Simmons suit, any other designer that occupies that sort of space because he operates, those high level operators are able to really uh, make the simple, the kind of basic thing look just you know delightful and i think this is another good um, indication of this too um so you've got this 1700 that has what do you call it navy some teal some pink and then reminds me a little bit of the mad hectics that i had from back in the day do you remember those i actually regret selling them but that model really hurt my feet because it had those weird kind of it had that tectronic thing that makes your feet step inward i forgot how it's called let me see if i can find it mad hectic new balance i had these from time ago these are kind of, they might, they might be my first New Balance actually, during the whole Crooked Tongue era. So these are the shoes I had, right? I had this one here. I had this one in the middle. I think I'm going to get up on the screen for you. What model is that? It's the MT580, right? So this is the model. I, I, I had, um, yeah, so that was a pack and I had the model. I think that model here in the middle. Or was it the other one? No, I think it might have been something else. Actually, no, it wasn't. I, thought, I don't think it was that actually. I think it might have been... That was a Stussy one, Mad Hectic and Stussy. I think, yeah, it was one of these ones. So August 2006, that New Balance. I had the one there in the middle. That was the one I had, right? And it had this weird tectronic-y sort of thing. So it's like the one I had was like pink, blue, and silver. I had this weird thing on the instep where it sort of like made your feet clump in. So it weren't the most comfortable shoes in the world. But again, a really great colorway, done really well. Again, you're not going to get, you know, Japanese brands aren't going to miss when it comes to New Balance colorways, but... Yeah, man. These running fig and Kif um, New Balances look cool. Um, it also continues. In classic Kif fashion, the co-created silhouettes is crafted from a medley of premium materials, various shades of pink, blah, 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 blah. So yeah, they're due to come out soon. Oh, end of January. So definitely check those out. They look really interesting. I like the look of them. A really cool shoe. And again, just another indication of just how high level um, Kif is kind of operating at. And again, if you're a brand out there and you're trying to introduce a new model and you want someone to kind of you know, trial it on the industry, on the market. There's no better person to go to than Kiff, man. He's he's the don when it comes to that sort of stuff. So, yeah, no surprise there. So, definitely check that out. Let's move on. What else we have here? We have some Futura trainers, some Gore-Tex shoes from Futura, which I'm, li I'm liking the fact that he's back in the scene and back involved and putting his face about, which you have to kind of thank Virgil for. This is kind of one of the things that's really cool about Virgil. Um, it's the fact that he uses his platform all the time to kind of boost up or to kind of give the microphone, give the platform to somebody else who he kind of admires. You know, look at the stuff that he's doing with Nigo. He's going to create a capture collection with him. Um, obviously, honoring some of the OGs that kind of laid the path for him. And the same with Futura, who's kind of, you know, responsible for doing some graffiti stuff on jeans that were tied in with the off white dunks. So he did the backdrop, I think, some of the designs for the. For the runway collection of Michael Jackson one that I was unfortunately pulled from the shops because of the it came out during the whole documentary thing. And also I think he'd done something else. I think he might have helped out with some gallery thing that Virgil did too. But regardless, he's he's getting a lot of kind of you know, he's coming back into the limelight. And I think um this collaboration is probably another indication of just how uh, much those kind of looks, those kind of cosigns from people in the industry help. And I know they do anyway, because I know when I was working at Marcel and I was getting all these streetwear heads involved and kind of helping them out to kind of, you know, he puts their money in their pocket and allow them to kind of, you know, speak to the younger brands. A lot of those guys were thankful for it. And a lot of those guys kind of were able to kind of use that voice, use the fact that they were getting co-signed by an outside brand to then kind of leverage that to other opportunities. So it's really cool to see that Virgil does that for people like Futura, right? Who could who could have been left behind by the new kid, but it's good to see him kind of constantly telling the kids, hey, I know you think I'm amazing, but this is the guy that taught me all my stuff. So 
great to see. So Futura. So this article from um, Hypebeast says the following: Gore-Tex recruits Futura from Apparel and Sneaker Collab called "Selected Memories of Functionality." Title of the exhibition. Um, so it looks like it's a Gore-Tex branded shoe. So I'm not sure what the brand is. I was going to say it was a Mizuno, but that that logo doesn't look like Mizuno. So it's a Gore-Tex branded shoe with Futura um, detail and designs on it. I'm pretty sure. There's no like kind of logo popping out from it from the outside in. I don't think so. It's like a black trainer with a high arch. I don't know what you. Do. I don't know what it's similar to, but it's very distinctive model, which is great for Gore-Tex if they're making their own trainers. It doesn't look at like anything else on the market right now. Only thing it maybe looks similar to is maybe a Reebok. That's sort of like weird, not an instant pump, but something else. It's like a Reebok looks similar to that. Um, but yeah, it looks pretty cool. You've got some black upper. You've got that pattern. I'm sure it's a, for probably uh, a Futura thing and then Gore-Tex written on the inside. So it says the following here. In November 2019, Gore-Tex kicked off its ongoing selective memories functionality series with stylist Stephen Mann highlighting a host of his favorite Gore-Tex infused garments. For the second edition, Gore-Tex brought um, on Futura, who showcased a dozen items, both functional and fashionable. Okay, it's not a collaboration. It's just him showing stuff that he f likes from Gore-Tex, right? Is that what it is? The artist Futura imprint, Futura Laboratories imprint, has been pl plenty busy with recent fashion collaboration, but made time to remix a Gore-Tex boiler suit, poncho, and Vibram Soul sneakers. Okay, so that's his kind of collaboration on them. This is him talking about it. It's pretty good. Quickly check this out, video. So here we are. This is the, the OG himself. that we made with our ensemble, the poncho, the tote bag, sick. and the Gore-Tex sneaker. Foot soldiers. Uh, What's that the model? It's a foot soldier. Check the soul. Vibram life. Vibram. Future Man. attack. Gore-Tex. So it's good to see someone like him just still about, man, still getting the love he deserves in the scene, man. Futura was so important back in the day for me. Like, I still remember, cr like, crying when I lost my fucking Futura Laboratories t-shirt back in the day. A navy one with the kind of point man um, illustration on the front. Like, it's still cool to see that, man. It's great. I love it. That's why when people say, oh, Streetway is dead, Streetway is dead. It's like, nah, it's not going to die. If people like this are still alive and other kids are looking at Futura and Nigo and stuff like Hiroshi done and using it as a kind of template to kind of do their own thing, those guys, Streetway will never die. It will just live forever and ever, especially for youth and it coming up. Like, this is kind of, it's just a rite of passage when it comes to giving a shit about things, right? I remember that was a podcast I listened to before that, that um, Hey Man podcast. I forgot with a guy, but that's what I got reduced to, right? That kind of, that kind of a love for loving things again. And that's where you kind of get it, that appreciation of stuff, of craftsmanship, of luxury, of exclusivity, whatever it may be called. You get it essentially if you're a dude, mostly, through streetwear. And then from there, it kind of leads to other places. You can kind of go down the print work. You can kind of go down the print magazine route, become like a book collector, archive fashionista, or just get involved in the fashion scene in general. It's such a great breeding ground for loads of different interests that can kind of segue from it. So this whole streetwear dead thing is dead to me, man. Streetwear is always alive. I like the sneakers, pretty cool. I wouldn't wear it personally myself. I don't really like the model. I don't like the front of it, but I like it as a shoe to wear around town. You know, for if you're the, what's that word called? If you're an urban, um, you know what that North Face do where they kind of dress people up in North Face jackets, but they're walking around the city. I don't know, whatever that thing is called. Um, urban outdoorsman, wherever it is. I think that will look pretty cool. But yeah, quite great to see uh, Futuro doing his thing. Another video here too. Ra, is that Jay, whatever his name is, he's still, he's still repping Futura, isn't he? That's an old school partnership, I forgot his name. This guy here, he's been, he's been, I think, um, Futura's agent for years. I forgot his name. He was back in the day on all over the blogs and stuff, but that's great to see, man. Or keep, keep, keep it in family still. So yeah, great stuff. Um, got a jacket here. A few, oh, that black jacket is banging. Woof. That's a great jacket. Look at something you see from, is that a headport or collaboration? The showroom will pay a post to the second edition of Sexy Memories Functionality. Wow. Is this from his personal archive? Because this is banging. Some good stuff in here. Yeah, it is personal archive. So it's all the Gotik stuff that he has. Futuro obviously has like the, you know, the San Camo, uh, Bape Snowball jacket. I'm not sure if that is a Snowball jacket, actually. It might not be. Um, in Gore-Tex too, that's just beautiful. The kind of thing that I'm always kind of keeping an eye on on Yahoo JP auctions. But yeah, some great stuff, man. Nike SUG, Gore-Tex. Like, bloody hell, he's got so much Gore-Tex stuff in his collection, hasn't he? Wow. But yeah, check it out. Um, Great stuff from, from Futura as per usual. Futura and Gore-Tex. Banging collaboration. Um, yeah. 
he's doing a damn thing, man. Futura for life. Let's move on. Human made and Aida Stan Smith. You seen these? So Nick talking about Nigo. Nick, uh, he's revealed. Is this the first collaboration done with Aida? I'm not too sure if it is, but um, you're familiar with Nigo. You know Nigo's rep, a baby Nate fame. You know, co co founder of being their boys club. Um, essentially one of the main architects of this beautiful thing that we call streetwear and just an overall legend when it comes to you know chains watches belts collecting interior design graphics you know with skate thing just an entire don in industry and obviously now with human made in print he's obviously dialed things down a bit from vape but also been able to kind of consistently hit things out of the park when it comes to his collection. I don't think I've seen a lookbook from Human Made that I don't like, right? You want to buy essentially most of the items that you see on that lookbook, which is a good sign for most brands. And he's, he's announced here that he's teasing an up-and-coming uh, Stan Smith collaboration. This article from Hypebeast is the following. Uh, after releasing a free stripe uh, capsule last October, the Human Made and Adidas Originals are teaming up again, this time for a new take on the timeless Stan Smith, teased by Human Made, found Japanese Nigo, and via Instagram. So this is what we got here, this little video, short clip one, I think it's a Stan Smith in it, did I mention, which is the heart logo on the side, which I'm not bit, I'm not too fussed about really. I quite like the fact that most Japanese brands are able to do this, the most simplest thing, tweak the tiniest things on an item and then kind of elevate um, its kind of level of appeal. Hiroshi Fujiwara did it recently with those new red wings that he put out, the black red wings, right? It's just essentially he couldn't find that model or that particular color combination on the market. So instead of going out and making a custom pair, Red Wing approached him. He made a capital collection with some nice John Smedley knits. And the Red Wing itself, just black with some with a white midsole. But just some really cool details he's added onto it that kind of elevated it. And again, no need to be crazy. No need to put cheetah print on it or to put Python leather, whatever it may be. Just do the things that you would personally want for something. And also something that could obviously be desired by most people most consumers and i think something like this would be a good um example of it it sort of reminds me of the raf simmons stan smiths as well that was the same i think the first sort of batch that came out just the, the, the standard model stan smith but with the raf simmons touch i think those are some of the best collaborations when they come out that way um let's see if we need to put out any more images because that's the first thing we saw just a little tip it and i'm, I'm sure it'll be, probably be an 80s stan smith model it'll be done in a very tasteful way um, it would just be a really good thing to see. But yeah, no, nothing so far from Nigo more regarding it. All he sees that first little video that I just posted, I just showed you guys here. But again, I'm eager to see what that looks like um, when it does happen. But yeah, Stan Smith for Human Made. That should be cool. Maybe we'll see more clothing as well from them as well come together. I think that'd be great as well. Because he's, he's always dressed, you know, that's old school hip hop influences. He's always got a pair of Adidas on as well. He'd never done a Nike collaboration, did he? I don't think so. He's always, which is interesting because Hiroshi doesn't mind. Hiroshi is, no, Hiroshi hasn't done Adidas either, has he? Yeah, Hiroshi, even though the, Hiroshi does every other brand except for Adidas, it seems like. But I wonder, I wonder why. I wonder if, if Nigo just got an exclusive Adidas partnership. They just keep putting money in his pocket so he just stays low to them. Or if he's just more entrenched with, um, you know, Adidas' hip hop roots and him being, a, you know, like an old school hip hop head, maybe that's probably part of his MO. But yeah, check those out if you're that way inclined. Human made for Aida Stan Smith, which are due to come out when soon, maybe we no, no idea, no date. So it's just, a little, just a little tease for now. Move on to my most favorite thing, actually, I've seen this week: um, a leaks Air Force One. So as you, as you, I'm sure guys are aware, a leaks is founded by Matthew Williams, one of the co-founders of Bin Trill from back in the day, also a former Lady Gaga, creative director, and just an all-round bad man when it comes to everything involved in streetwear and the scene. He eventually launched his own brand, Elix, which is essentially like, you know, a modern day, a modern day helmet lang, right? A contemporary helmet lang, I don't know. So maybe sacrilege to some fashion heads, but my platform can say what I want. So he's, um, you know, the first, I think the Kanaki collaboration we've got out now at the moment, the sort of running one with the jackets and the trainers, has gone down pretty well. I think a lot of the stuff has sold out. The shoes I really like. I really like the fact that he took that weird Moon Runner, I forgot what it's, Moon Rider, or whatever that model is, and put his touch on it again, not taking the easy route out and just uh, uh, adopting a kind of uh, popular model, introducing something else to the kind of forefront. And also the idea that he's pushing physical exercise to kids who who are probably spending more time sitting in front of computers with bots trying to buy hype releases to sell them on uh, so resell them on StockX. So the fact that he's built, he's kind of going to Nike instead of just making a 
you know, silly collab. No, he's got two. That's a good thing. He's got this stuff and the other stuff. So the other stuff is more athletic, CrossFit, cross training kind of way and running, whatever it may be called. And this stuff is a bit more, you know, fashiony, right? So it's a bit more lifestyle pieces. And um, I, this is one of my favorite collaborations I think he's put out so far. Um, again, it's a it's a it's classic model Nike Air Force One High. If you know anything about me, you know I love Air Force Ones. I think Air Force Ones were in my top three Nikes of all time which will be a Jordan 4 Air Max 19 Air Force One. I think if I had to wear any model for the rest of my life, it would be those three models, Air Force One, um, uh, Nike Air Max 90 and Jordan 4. I think I could find a way to wear those most outfits. And uh, Matthew M. Williams has decided to preview four new colorways for his collaboration with 1017 Elix 9SM, which is the main um, kind of ready-to-wear side of Elix. Not that. I, I think he's co... I'm pretty sure... The stuff that's running and the other stuff is mainly his name, MMW, right? I think so. That's with Nike. And then this stuff is more in line with his runway stuff. So we'll probably see these shoes debuted on the Paris runway. I think he's he's the last to show on Paris, I think, in Paris menswear. I think he's the last to show. I think it might be Sunday or something. So check those out. But yeah, um, so far we've got a sneak peek um, with, uh, I think, his dog and a lot of Okoba, who's now um, styling, I think, for leaks. The former stylist and the former kind of one of the creative leads or one of the people that are involved with the kind of success of Vetemar and then she went to help out Demna at Balenciaga but I think now I don't think she's styling for Balenciaga anymore so I think she's kind of moved over to Elix which is great to see and she's obviously done some other stuff loads of editorial stuff and loads of runway stuff for Mark Jacobs and a few other people so she's getting about and doing her bit as pieces as well so a cute picture here with her and a dog in the background but the most important thing um, here to see in the whole entire picture is these air force ones right get them up here on a screen so i think it's four colorways and i'm a big fan of each i i was mucking around with certain colorways myself of this sort of model um on nike id so i'm i'm very i'm sensitive to the fact that you know sometimes again the opportunity to collaborate on a sneaker if you're a brand or you're creative it can be a bit nauseating you can get a bit, a bit overwhelmed um but i also appreciate the creatives are able to go into a brand like nike and just deliver on something they've always wanted themselves so imagine if you're a sneakerhead or if you're a guy that's into fashion or likes clothes or likes trainers there might be a time where you're like man i wish nike would just make classic air force one in highs luxury leather without the nylon strap in a variation of black and white because that's essentially what you always like to wear day in day out you can't find them on the on the on the shelves the closest place you're going to get a colorway like this might be jd sports because they have you know really basic models but again the levers are going to be good the shape's going to you know fall apart after a few wears so if you're able to kind of get the key set factory and just lux up all the materials um you know get some nice you know some nice finishing touches on the top of it to make it really stand out from everyone else why not take that opportunity and i love it i love it so you got here four colors i think variations of black and white basically um on the left here you've got like an all an all black upper an all black um air force one with a white swoosh and then you've got the gold sort of embossed um accents on the back of the hill that's similar to like what um um what they called i guess they called achilles what are those shoes achilles called I forgot anyway. You know what I'm talking about, that shoe. So I like the kind of logo that they do on the back of the hill with a sort of script stamped on it. I think it's embossed or maybe it's screen printed. I'm not too sure. So sort of like a tumbled leather upper. I don't sure if this if the seams have been kind of sealed or they got that kind of rounded. I think they do. They're not raw seam, which again improves the quality. And then you've got these wax, lace, wax laces at the top. So you've got an all black pair with a white swoosh. And you've got a completely all black pair, triple black, which I'm a big fan of. And then... If we continue on here, we've got a pair that probably my favorite of the bunch, which has got the Alix uh, belt buckle strap at the top of the shoe, nylon strap, which kind of is a cool look because that colorway is very reminiscent of some old school uh, shoes that I might have seen in a sneaker magazine or stuff that I might have come out specifically in a Japanese market. It's an all white upper with a black swoosh and a solid black midsole. Again, classic, no fucking around. There's no extra nonsense, no source added onto it. The only source added onto it, the only bit of individuality he's put onto it is his actual addition of his own kind of, you know, signature um, Elix, uh seat. What do you call What do you call it? Airplane seat buckle. I forgot what they, that thing is called, but oh, it's on leather as well. The strap is a nylon, it's leather. Oof, 
that's such a good touch um so yeah beautiful 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 model beautiful collaboration and then we've got an all white pair and pure money pair so for those of you guys who want to be trap fantastic there's another pair too with the leather up with a leather strap and the buckle on the top so again um brilliant colorways overall i think probably one of my favorite collaborations i've seen to date very simply done very well done uh great execution and look like I'd be up for wearing every single one of these pairs. Like that will go all in my collection. And I'd wear them all instantly, straight away. Um, great shoes, great everything. Like I'd wear those essentially straight away at the Bergheim. Those black Air Force with the white swoosh. That would be my Bergheim shoe. Because I think I've always said that actually. As much as I'm a big fan of Rick's and Rick Owens and what he does, I'm not really the biggest Geo Basket fan. I don't think they work too well on my feet. The sole's a bit too thin. I've always had the kind of dream that if i did have another pair of geo baskets i'd maybe do a bit of a sole swap and put maybe a chunkier sole at the bottom or maybe take the sole off and get them redone by a cobbler and have like a really thick wedge sole on the bottom of them i think they look a bit better but and again i'm pretty sure if rick did a collaboration with nike they look similar like this right it'd be like a kind of idea of like let me just wear my standard shoe my everyday beater and then kind of change my apparel on top um but obviously now rick's in a completely different lane he's doing the, the whole high heel boots and stuff but um, again for an everyday wear for something i could wear with most of my outfits very versatile trainers i'd wear every single one of these pairs honestly so good i'm hoping when they come out they're easily to easy to get hold of probably won't be but one can only hope Ooh, look at the white pair they've got a silver buckle on a white pair Ooh, i wonder what pair is gonna be the most popular um again they'll probably won't resell that great what should i say that no i wouldn't should say that because they're black in it Black, all black shoes don't really, what's the last all black shoe that did really well on resale? It's not really a thing, in it. They usually have to be a bit loud and a bit crazy. Um, again, they've got the buckle on them. They've got the little embossed logo. And so I think if you're a kid and you want to resell, you might, or you want to floss, you might just wear these and tuck your trainers inside your socks, right? So people can see that they're not just some standard Air Force Ones, but someone could tell from afar because that, that's some good leather, man. Look at that. That's some fucking good leather. Seams are sealed as well. Tumbled leather. Like just, Great details. I'm not sure if it's the white pair. Do you think the white pair has white whack laces or just regular nylon? I'm not too sure. But I love it, man. I love them. Especially that that pair here with the white, with the black swoosh and the black sole. That's really good. That's really going to stand out on the shelves. Yeah. So I can't wait to see these. I'm sure they're going to come out very soon. Hence why he's probably leaking them and showing them now. Here's some great line sheets that we're seeing here too. Oh, it's oh they're going to do a pop-up. Okay. Let me, read it. Let me read them then. Let me read this article. Um, crafted from premium tumbled leather, Alex's um, Air Force Ones are presented in all white. Uh, uh, we saw that this uh, this accented feature further by the gold and silver foil stamps on lateral heel counter. Williams first debuted his first technical year at Practical Design 2018. Uh, the, get into a look of each colorway right here and expect a limited release at Alex's Prayers Pop Up Shop. Wow, located on 1214 Rue. Le Fond, whatever that word is, from 12 p.m. to 7 at 16. So, yeah, to, to today. They're actually available to buy today in the store in Paris. So, yeah, definitely check those out um, if you're available, if you're around. But, yeah, great, man. I, I actually like seeing these line sheets. It's pretty cool, isn't it? See these sort of uh, tech packs for these trainers. <sighs> that looks so fucking beautiful. Like, all of it. Such a, again, so classy done. No crazy stuff on the insole or on the tongue. Just nice little um, touches. Ten seventeen and nine SM on the on the lace jewels, which I, I all automatically get get rid of all the time when I first have them. But yeah, check that out, man. Leaks for um, Nike. Maybe one of my favorite Air Force One collaborations I've seen today. And again, if you know anything about me, you know how much I love Air Force One highs. I probably prefer an Air Force One high over a mid or a low. I think they're a lot more versatile and probably I like the shape more on my foot um again for somebody that's got a wide foot and a clumpy foot like myself an air force one is probably the perfect shoe to wear so definitely check those out man one of my favorite shoes so far that's seen leaked during the whole paris runway stuff yeah uh, matthew always does some really good stuff with the leaks out there next on the list what do we have here next on the docket next on the docket so we have um oh these are pretty trap fantastic J don c for one of Kanye's former best friends who I don't think he hangs I don't know have you ever have anyone has anyone seen a picture of Don C and Kanye in the same place I've not actually even during the whole Sunday service thing it seems as if they've 
proper falling out. I'm not too sure if they have or they haven't. Again, just me speculating from my dusty apartment in the middle of East London. But it looks like they're not friends at all. But, you know, it is what it is. You know, you can't be friends with people forever. And again, I'm pretty sure he's probably thankful that he's able to, you know, have a career in the industry, doing the things he loves um, many years on. And he's all done this, obviously, through his Don C imprint. Uh, Don C, obviously, one of the main... Uh, figures at Good Music back in the day. I'm pretty sure he was a manager or something. I'm pretty sure an A&R. I don't know what his actual role was, but again, just a guy behind the scene connecting the dots and, and obviously a further and sneak ahead in a really classic Nike talk sneak ahead fashion where he kind of matches his t-shirts with his trainers, but he's kind of elevated it and kind of taken it to the kind of hood chic level. So I quite like the stuff he does. Again, I wouldn't wear any of it. I don't like the hats. I don't like the shorts or any of the basketball stuff because again, I'm, I'm not American. I think there's a lot of it that's really tied or intrinsic to americana sportswear and athletics and professional sports nba nfl hockey there's some really if you're about that life the, this brand's going to catch with you more so i think for a foreigner it's a bit you don't really get it too much like he's, he probably can tell you up an entire story epilogue about the history of starter caps and why it was important that he did them and you know the history of it coming from the you know the the trappers in chicago back in the day there's a lot to the whole story but for me just as a fan looking from the outside in i think it's great to see him again i think he brings a different kind of offering to the market it's not for me but i think the, for the guy that likes the i won't say gaudy but i think for like the guy that likes a bit of flash and to be a bit more you know to you want your shoes to look like you remember those at least ever since i showed previously right they're quite simple right they're like the heads trained they're like something like You'd want, you know, if you know, you know, sort of shoe. But if you're a guy who wants a shoe that actually looks like something that's been designed by somebody else and it's not something you could buy on Foot Locker, Don sees your guy in it and Just Don's the one. So this is a news from um, Hype Beast saying we get the first look at Just Don and Nike Air Force One releasing during NBA All Star Weekend, which I have no idea when that is. But um, this article is the following Don C. Uh, just on sorry, Nike have a brand new Air Force One collaboration on the way for an NBA All Star Weekend there in Chicago. A homage to Don's to Just On's frontman Don C, uh, home city. The luxurious high top features a colorway and a detail inspired by the Windy City's flag. So it's inspired by Chicago. I didn't know Chicago even had a flag to be honest. What's Chicago flag look like? I had no idea Chicago even had a flag. Let me see a Chicago flag. What is that? <laughs> Uh, Chicago flag. What does that even look like? Okay, I didn't know Chicago even had a flag. My days, okay. You learn something new all the time. So, um, it says here, the flag of Chicago. The flag of Chicago consists of two blue horizontal stripes or bars on a field of white. Each stripe, one sixteenth height of the fourth flag and placed slightly less than one sixth of the way from the top and bottom. Between the two horizontal blue stripes are four and red pointed stars. The flag of the, okay. Uh, I didn't know. I didn't even know states had flags. To be honest, that's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, the, obviously you can tell the inspiration behind it. You got an Air Force One high, isn't it? Right. It's a really weird. I think it's a hybrid. So he's got that sort of Air Force One, Air Force Two, whatever model that he does all the time. Back sort of hill tab. That's not a high, in it. That's a mid. Well, like a court, like a like a three quarter, whatever that height is. I quite like it. Solid blue, similar to that the like MCA. Virgil Air Force Ones that he put out recently during for his exhibition. And then you've got these little red accents. So you've got a nice red inner, nice red um, highlight on the front of the toe box with that swoosh there on the top, which really gives it a really big pop. And you've got the red accents at the back there too. Just done two written on the back. They look fucking lush. Is that velvet on the inside? Woohoohoohoo! They look beautiful. So you've got the, the flag of Chicago on the inside of the tongue there. And you've got this lovely plush red scarlet violet whatever it may be um on the inside it looks beautiful wow uh so oh they just on air force one 2.52 okay what so is that going to be february 15th is that what they're coming out revealed by donsi's wife uh christine the high cut design takes donsi's air force 100 collaboration for 2017 by combining elements of the air force one and the air force two and air force three yeah i knew it that's the high right it's really so that's a good you know i said i wasn't a fan of hybrids this is a really good hybrid so it's like an air force one mixed with an air force two and air force three really cool i like it man i'm a big fan of it um da -da -da -da. 
Uh, the uppers are constructed from a smooth leather, while the collar strap opts for a tumbled leather and bright red appears on a satin, or oh, satin, not nylon, satin sock liner and small toe box, which is just on heel tab branding. Crawley uh, Post states that is this new Don C Air Force One will release on February 15th. A retail price has not yet been confirmed, but they are beautiful, aren't they? Booming. Wow, I like them. They're really nice. Again, if you're into that sort of style, and that's your sort of vibe, then definitely pick those up, man. And again, it's coming from somebody that's got a lot of a lot of uh, history in the sneaker game, and somebody that's been there, done that wore the t-shirt. You know, even got collaboration with Hennessy out there. Yeah, so great to see him, man. Awesome, awesome stuff, and great to see him still navigating around the scene, even without the Kanye kind of co-sign or standing next to him. That's great to see, isn't it? Regardless. Boop, boop, boop. What else we want to talk about here? Let's move on. Boop, ba, boop, ba, boo. What else we talk about here? What else we talk about? Um, let me look at my list of items I want to go through. Do, do, do. Levels no improved, just to clear. Do, do. There's loads of fashion stuff to get through in it that I want to actually talk about, but I'll probably save that for tomorrow until I see some more. What else do I want to see here? Um, oh, let's go through some street style. Paris Fashion Week street style. So it's now Paris Fashion Week. I'm sure most of you guys are aware. Um, loads, all the industry insiders and movers and shakers are in Paris showcasing their gear. It's pretty cool to see that although people keep saying streetwear's over, streetwear's over, all the big streetwear brands that you know and love are having their showrooms based in Paris during menswear. Uh, collection showing I'm pretty sure because all the buyers around are, are around right because I'm sure if you're a store that's buying men's fashion you're probably going to buy men's streetwear too it's going to be hand in hand just going to follow the Dover Street market model so everyone that's in the industry that's part of the kind of menswear streetwear side of things is in Paris at the moment and obviously the street style is one of the biggest things to kind of pop out during the whole time people wearing all their wacky clothes but it's, there's sometimes some good little nods as to what you can expect for the seasons to come you know usually people here are pushing the envelope and setting the trends for the new stuff coming forward you know not for me personally because you know wouldn't be caught dead wearing some of the stuff that these people are wearing but it's a podcast make it entertaining let's look at some of these people are wearing and go from there so this is from vogue courtesy of phil O, who i'm sure you guys are aware of is one of the big uh, proponents of the street where the street style pictures let's go through some stuff and see what i think is look it looks good um so you've got here somebody wearing vlone a pretty uh, tubby guy. It might be Young Lord himself. And you've got my man um, Quaver here. I quite like Quaver's outfit, actually. Are those Jordan 4s or are those uh, Virgil shoes? I'm not too sure. No, I think they might be Jordan 4s, actually. I quite like them. They are Jordan 4s. I like his jeans. Kind of a, a slightly boot-cut style, which is all the raving at the moment. Everyone's sort of wearing boot-cut style jeans at the moment. Um, which is great to see. Uh, the skinny jeans are over for the most part. So if you're wearing skinny jeans, it's it's done. It's done out here for you. Uh, you've got here. So I forgot the guys from Boy Better Know. I forgot his, I forgot their names, but they're dressed as well, head to toe in off white. It looks like for the most part. Not a fan of either outfit. You have got this lady here wearing a furry coat. You have got this guy wearing. Imagine imagine making those Virgil shoes look shit. This guy here, I think that's the guy from Ghetto Kitchen or something, right? You've got some sort of kitchen stuff. But look at this guy on the left. He's wearing the Virgil Dunks and he strangled them. I don't know how you can strangle the Virgil Dunks and make them look terrible, but this guy has achieved them. So congratulations to you. you got Cohen Frost, the OG, wearing the old school uh, chomper hoodie with the Billionaire Boys Club jeans. You know, I like seeing something like a Cohen Frost get money because he's an old school streetwear guy like me. And all the things that he missed out on, all the things that he was too poor or two um, lacking in resources to acquire, he's now buying in the droves. He's buying all the archive, all the old school pieces that only heads would know about and care about. He's got the old school being their boys club t uh, jeans on with the massive dog uh, screen print on the front. They used to crack all the time and looked all shitty and cheap the more you wore them. Oh man, so, so cool to see. Um, you've got another guy here wearing a really oversized outfit, which looks great. So it's brown, uh, check outfit looks great i don't know who it's by but it looks really cool it's cut amazing look how oversized everything looks but nothing looks like it's dragging that's that's perfect expert tailors at, um craftsmanship they are tailoring this guy here in the background when everyone is wearing these nike dunks by off-white are terrible in it he's got like a chain across his suit pink hair the millionaires and those dunks it's a terrible outfit but hey what can you do um i like this girl's um wallabies they look quite nice this guy's top is nice actually the outfit on the right is probably the nicest thing on the in the kind of image but again 
it's probably boring for a street style way i like that shirt there this pleated top is really interesting this guy there looks cool too i like the combination it's like the gray like olivey style and he's wearing those boots that are meant to be a little bit they're a little bit basic bitch in it what are they called again they're like the la favorite of a chelsea boot they're a bit you know new york favorite wearing you know with like a gilet but i like them they look pretty cool there um oh i like these trousers what the fuck are these trousers models wearing i'm pretty sure he's a model right wow so he's got these tabby boots on the tabby high heel boots on and these amazing i'm not sure if they're like they're like disco infused leggingy type things there's a guy here in the background who's got my Jaden boots on, but they're brand new. So they don't have my uh, slanted heel that I have on mine, which I probably have to get replaced or I probably have to buy a new pair because mine are banged up. But they look really cool. Um, you've got a cheetah print top on there. So again, loads of really slim. There's not skinny. It's probably the skinniest thing I've seen so far. A lot of like regular st regular sized uh, trousers out here, isn't it? It looks like so far. Everyone's kind of switching. This guy looks a little bit like um, Review Bra. You know, the guy that did, reviews all the fast food on YouTube and stuff and reviews burgers from Burger King. It looks a little bit like him, isn't it? Um, you got this guy wearing a terrible outfit too. It's like a mix between, I don't know, tech wear and I don't know what else. Is that a junior top or a com top with some weird chest rig thing and pants that look strange and uh, are those the shocks that Virgil did a collaboration with? Yeah, they, it, it might be all a all com thing because he's got those com trainers on. But yeah, I don't like the outfit. I think it looked pretty shitty. What's his name? Jean Jacques uh, jo Jolie. Jolie. The, I'm sure the N is silent, but yeah, it doesn't look too great. I quite like Tiger's outfit. I would have swapped it there. The Dunks would Air Force One or Jordan with White Air Forces. I quite like Tiger's outfit. He's got an off white denim denim suit on. It looks really cool. It's kind of uh, got his patterns all over him and stuff. And he's got the millionaires on, of course. I think that looks really, that really suits him pretty well. Um, I'm not a fan of whatever this woman's wearing. No, I pass. I like the guy the ninja outfit there at the background. Don't like his shoes. Those shoes got to die in it. Um, what are they called again? Um, they like the they like the hipster version of like the feelers that all the basic girls wear. You know those stacked feelers. What are these shoes called, man? Um, damn it, I've got the name of them. The massive platform trainers that everyone's got at the moment. Oh. But yeah, they need to they need to die already. Too many um, basic people wearing them. And again, if you're going to wear those boots, wear them like you, you wear them every day. Don't wear them brand new for one occasion like they're some special item. Because they're really not. Um, uh, quite like that kilt. That's quite nice. Those Air Force Ones, what are they? Are they Air Force Ones? There's that collaboration. It is a collaboration. It's, oh, those are the phone posts that Air Force Ones, I think, right? you got Pop Smokers out there. That's pretty cool, isn't it? He looks great, man. He's got an off-white sort of like bathrobe on, some jeans and some white trainers. Really trap star, fantastic. He's got all his jewels on because he is pop smoke, you know. And then you've got here some nice outfit too, boots. Here's what it is. That suit's quite great. Uh, Tiffany Goody, whatever that name is. You've got, uh, who's this guy? Tyrod Taylor. I'm not sure who that is. I'm not sure. I don't really like the outfit either, to be fair. I think that's a Virgil jacket. And those bottoms would cinch at the... Oh, Jesus. Yeah, I'm not going to... There's more... So let's say the better. Oh, they are Jordans, isn't it? You've got here another good outfit. Uh, and then you've got here... That's Shirelle, isn't it? Shirelle. Shirelle, yeah? DJ, okay. She's doing a damn thing. She's out here. Out in Paris getting decked out with Virgil stuff. That's great to see. Big up her. You've got Declan Chan in JW Anderson's shirt. Not a big fan of it. I think he's probably too short to wear that. You've got Takashi Murakami. Always looking the best. I like what he wears. Uh, these outfits, I'm not too fan of. I'm not sure who that guy is, but I'm not a fan of that either. Some good stuff, man. Some good patterns and stuff, whatever. But most of the stuff's a little bit gaudy for my liking. You got Tommy Ton out there. Is he taking pictures as well? Has he got his camera on him? No, he's not in it. He's doing his own brand at the moment, so he's probably not. But yeah, I'm not a fan of anything anyone's wearing here. Heron Preston looking good actually. He's got a good outfit on there. Is that his own brand stuff so probably is right. Yeah, so he's doing a damn thing. Him and his missus riding the thing. Some guy called Mark Fawn in F in an off white shirt. Don't like that at all. Pfft, nope, thank you. Wanna be bloody Osiris there doing his thing. Uh oh yeah. That's a great outfit, isn't it? Kirby from Pia Moss doing a damn thing in Ke so this lady, Kennedy Yanko. Yeah, he looks banging. I love the boots, I love the jeans, I love that PVC whatever it is leather overcoat i love the trap star chains banging 
Uh, oh, look at that Rick outfit. Oh, oh, slide. What? What is this? Pictures thirty-seven. I'm gonna put this as the image for the cover art of the show. Oh, that Rick outfit is banging. I think it's all Rick, right? Rick dunks and the girl next. Oh, what the? F Who is that? That outfit is banging. Woohoo! That's an outfit for me. Those original Rick dunks cannot be tested, can they? Cannot be tested. But yeah, big up him. And yeah, everyone's doing their thing, man. These two models look great too. I love everything. Uh, who's that guy? Evan Mock in Off White. He looks quite cool actually in that. He, he actually makes Off White look really decent here. This guy, I quite like that outfit. It looks really cool on him. Um, not a fan of Justin Bones' outfit at all. Uh, that's the guy from High Snobiety. Not a fan of what he wears at all. Luke obviously wearing the great stuff standard uh rick owens and jeans combo that he loves to wear when he's out in paris so that looks great um yeah some good stuff here man oversized jacket you got jess josh Posk petkowitz the old school gq or street style don uh oh are those are those um those are the prada boots right they're so nice man so fucking nice i love those shoes but yeah um great for uh, great look from everyone involved i guess Paris streetwear, street style makes me jealous. I wish I was out there. Oh, I like the way he styled these. Um, the same. He's got my uh, wave runners, black laces. Described any weird jeggingy type. What are they? Like a padded trousers. That's a weird way. He I like how he styled those shoes. Look pretty cool there. But yeah, great overall. Everyone's doing a damn thing. Um, keep it up as per usual, or keep it up. I don't know. Well, what would you say to people when they're wearing good outfits? You say keep it up. You don't say keep it up, do you? But yeah, <laughs> whatever, man. Uh, street style, courtesy of Philip. Oh, I'll put it on the show notes for you guys to check out yourselves. If you're listening to the audio, it's a bit annoying me describing and going ooh ah of the trousers, but I'll link in the show notes for you guys checking it out. But anyway, that's an hour, man. One hour, we did it once again. Thank you so much for tuning in. The Excellent Zinga Show with me, host Agostino. As per usual, if you're watching via the YouTube app or the YouTube application on your desktop, wherever it may be, smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment, let me know what you think of the show. If you're listening via the podcast app, leave me a five star review, share the show, let everyone know what I'm talking about, and you know, spread the love, spread the love, spread the word, get it out there. And I'll see you guys again tomorrow for another episode of the show. Until then, take care, be safe, and look left and right when you're crossing the road. See you guys very, very soon. Bye. Peace, be easy, safe.